I always say to people, you know, a lot of people are like, well, what is a horror game? What isn't a horror game? I always, my, my, my motto is every game's a horror game when Beep Salt's playing it. That's like what we say <laughs> in my stream because I get jump scared by everything. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to a candid conversation with my name is Breesby, and we are continuing on with our spooky series for October. I'm super excited because I have my first content creator. I, I've been talking mostly to devs uh, in the month of October. I got my first content creator. Although I think you are. I was about to say. I was going to say good news for you. I know. I'm I think on my first game. Yes. So, so do you mm -hmm. want to introduce yourself? Who are you? What do you do? Hi, I'm Beep Salt. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. I'm a horror content creator. Uh, I also work for like GDQ doing like safety stuff. Um, I've been on streaming and doing Let's Plays since 2008. Um, and I just started my first uh, project as a dev making a game that's a visual novel. Um, I'm very excited to be working on that too. That's so freaking cool. So yeah, yeah I, I have seen you tweeting about that recently. So for some context, you and I... Uh, you are actually one of the first people that I've interviewed that I really don't know a whole ton about. And that makes me really excited because oh, I feel yeah. like there's a lot to like talk about for you. Oh yeah, for sure. But you and I sort of know each other basically from Twitter, but because of GDQ stuff, I was on yeah. GDQ staff recently. So I got to meet you like very, very briefly at SGDQ. Um, and then I just, I know you from the internet and I didn't even realize you were a horror content creator until I saw you in the um, Eek 3 what? presentation. Thank you. I was yeah. like, what is the showcase? And I was like, I know them. That's yeah. interesting. <laughs> that was a super fun opportunity. Like I know so, so I, a lot of my horror content, I mean, some of it, like over the last two years I've gone through and played I would say like 10 different Resident Evil games that I'd never played the Resident Evil series before. I'd been like a lot like more like psychological stuff and a lot less like shooty shooty. Um, but over the last, I don't know, since 2020, when I came back to streaming, I've been at least a couple times a month exclusively playing a bunch of indie horror games. And so it started off with me making little collections on itch.io that I would just like look for stuff that looked cool and kind of check out stuff. Um, but I also ended up re reaching out and like doing some stuff with DreadX and playing a bunch of their stuff too. And like kind of all of those guys and gals and that are involved in that are so amazing and all the games are so interesting. And like as a horror content creator or just even like a horror experiencer, I don't want to, I want to play that game that's going to be so unique and weird that I literally could not have anticipated anything about it. And so like the games in that showcase really are on that same level where it's like, this is F-Zero, but horror. And this is like, you know, a really cr crazy horror game where it's like, you would never expect, like, it's not just your, you know, third person shooter or something like that. There's just like, the most interesting stuff in those collections. And that's why indie horror stuff really speaks to me because I can have that like surprise and, you know, good feeling from that. And I loved working with those, with everyone that was involved with that too and watching it was so cool. Yeah, yeah. I think you and I are kind of on the same page where indie horror is very, there's a lot of room for experimentation. And yeah. I oh, think yeah. that's the most exciting part of it. Um, I'm curious how you got into horror in the first place. Like why, why'd you land on scary stuff? Yeah, I think so when I first experienced like cinema, right, like movies in general, I really gravitated towards stuff like darker. I like I, re I know that this isn't a horror movie, but The Fifth Element is a movie that I really like stands out in my mind as like something I watched a lot or like was really focused on for a long time in like, you know, the late 90s. Mm -hmm. And the darkness and like weird like post-apocalyptic kind of vibe that's in that movie kind of had me branching further and further out. And so I, I didn't play a lot of horror stuff, but my, the first like horror game I really played was Eternal Darkness. And that game scared me so much that I literally couldn't play it. Because it's- I don't think I've played that one. It's like, at this point, I'm not scared of it, right? Because yeah. I, you know, whatever. But, but the reason that that game is so scary is it does all of the things that the, that all of the meta- that horror games base themselves off of now 100% is Eternal Darkness because it's that third, breaking the fourth wall, not third wall, fourth wall, breaking the fourth wall where where like 
The game turns your comp- your TV volume down. The game <gasps> blue screens. There's a fly on your monitor because it, you, it they like have a realistic image of a fly crawling around. Like the character's head falls off while you're walking around. So like it's so, and then, cause you see this, you see this in Doki Doki Literature Club, right? Yes. You see this in Undertale. Yes. You see, I was playing um, this horror game that I really enjoyed, another VN called Cooking Companions. There's that same thing where the game is letting you know that it knows you're playing it. And that's what Eternal Darkness does. And that like, that scared me so bad. And so when I started doing Let's Plays, I was friends with someone who had done some like blind Let's Plays where they had never played some of these horror games. So I played Clock Tower 3 with no experience in playing that game. And that one's not super scary, but it was that horror like vibe. And then after that, I just started doing it more and more and more and playing more horror games and then kind of became known for it. And it's because I feel like for me, I'm, I touch a lot of these like like psychological horror stuff, like a Silent Hill, right? Where I'm, t- I like to touch these like traumas and and pain spaces, but in a way where you can also step back at it. It's not you. You can like bring a lightness to it, especially as a content creator, right? And so a lot of games I play, the themes are so dark. A lot of these indies are so dark, and when it hits, it hits. You know what I mean? And that's kind yeah. of why I just continued to do it and I keep coming back to it to like experience these same like these new traumatic stories that are just like obfuscated because it's not me you know yeah yeah Yeah. no I think I I also am in the same boat and now that you've you've mentioned eternal darkness and kind of how that horror works I have to go play it because it's my favorite kind of horror if you're listening to this and you've never seen eternal darkness okay so first off it's on the gamecube and it's really expensive (gasps) now but you it's probably available some other way Uh, but anyway there if if you have the chance to go back to my let's play I did a let's play of it where I showed every angle of the game, every extended thing, all of it. It's still on YouTube and it's available. Um, I've seen people play it in the last like two years and they are still as scared of it as I was, you know, 15 years ago when I played it for the first time. It's so good. That's an incredible, that is a mark of a really incredible horror game. If you can stand the test of time and people can still play it to this day. Like I know plenty that have aged horribly. Oh yeah, definitely. I was playing Martian Gothic and that, that game surely did not age. <laughs> I don't see. I've never played that one either. I, I am fairly new to indie or just horror in general. I started yeah. with indie horror. So like the whole, the classics, like I missed Resident Evil. I missed Silent Hill, basically. Like I I didn't play that until later in my 20s. Yeah. Um. So I feel like you have a, a kind of a cool perspective of it because you've been doing this for a really long time. Um, I think it's it's really nice too, because when you don't have, a lot of people have like, baggage attached with certain things. So like when I've gone through the last two years and played a bunch of Resident Evil games, by the everyone's always like four is the best Resident Evil, da 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 da. I hated that one. Really? But I but I had such a fun time playing six because I played six with a friend. And see everyone like fucking hate six. I know. So like it's it's when you're like old school or like really like into it as it grows, you can really have this like baggage behind it but if you've never experienced any of the silent hills who knows Uh, like i hated four when it came out but i went back and played four not that long ago and like without the baggage of like this is not silent hill i really liked it so it was a very interesting experience do you have any games that you've gone back and you've been like like games that you loved that you really were nostalgic for and you went back like eternal darkness you said you went back and it was great have you had that you went back and you were like oh like (laughs) this is disappointing that's a good question so like for me i feel like there's a lot of games where i was like okay with it but everyone's hyped it up so much like so i replayed silent hill not too long ago silent Mm -hmm. hill 2 sorry and i didn't i don't think silent hill 2 was bad by any chance but i think that if you if silent hill 2 came out right now it is so tropey and all of like the moments in it but it it was the originator, right? Like it right. was like, I'm a bad guy and this is the hell I'm living in. And like, I feel like that's obviously so oversaturated now. So looking it, from the lens of now, just like I was like looking through Resident Evil 4 with the lens of now and I was like, this is unpleasant. Um, some of these games that I really loved. But the thing for me is I still will keep that attachment. Even if I'm like, 
maybe I didn't really like that that much the yeah. second time or third time. I still like have those memories of really enjoying it when I was younger. So for me, I'm just like, mm, it's still fun. I still like it. Yeah, so. it's it's hard mm-hmm. to let go of that stuff. There's oh, plenty yeah. of games where I'm like, this is a terrible game, but I love it so oh, much yeah. and I'm not oh, going to let it go. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Do you Are you a big horror movie person as well or mostly games? I am. Um, I really love horror movies. In fact, like, again, it's that. So I was when I was working on um, the game I'm working on right now, I was writing this outline and I realized I was spelling literally everything out for the player. Like I was like A, B, C, D. And I was like thinking about other horror horror stuff and like especially horror movies. I was starting to think about those. And like the thing about horror, what I wrote down and I'm like notes are literally right here. So I'm looking at it. But horror is like freedom, confusion and transience. And that's why like for me, horror movies are always going to like hit super good because it's going to be like like, I'm just thinking about, for some reason, the movie Time Crimes popped into my head, which is like a, a I think it, they're, I think it's Spanish uh, horror movie with like time travel and like, literally, you do not understand anything that's happening in that movie the first time because it's so confusing. And I think that that's what draws me in is the need to try and figure it out, you know? Yeah. And I think that's why horror movies, I don't get, I don't know about you, but I get so scared during horror games, but I do not get scared during horror movies. Yes, I am exactly all. like that. There's something I, about I, being in control that I, it, it's that, that's my problem. Yeah, It's absolutely that. Where like, and I also have like, this is weird too, but I also have like certain types of things that I know scare other people that don't scare me at all. Like Ooh. a ghost, I watched, um, I watched, oh, I can't remember what it was. The one with Ethan Hawke that just came out too long ago. First off, it's a period piece. So I was not... I was like, this isn't scary. It's like sure. 1977. I don't care. But it was all like ghosts and stuff. And so ghosts do not get me at all. Like okay. in a video game, sure. It, the ghosts are still going to scare me in a video game because it's yeah. going to like, you know. But in movies, it's got to be like, there's certain weird things that scare me in movies. They're not, I'm just not going to get scared by movies the same way. And like you said, it's about the control of it. Like I can get jump scared so easily when I'm playing any video game because I'm yeah. I'm the one pushing the story forward for sure. Yeah, that's why yeah. I almost I sometimes prefer certain games to just watch somebody else play it because even oh, I yeah. could be sitting next to the person, right? Same distance from the screen, but I'm not the one holding the controller. Oh, yeah. And so I'm like, I'm fine. Like somehow I, I'm golden. Like I don't need to think about this. So yeah, I totally get that. It's really funny too, because there are some times when I'm watching someone play the game and I'm more scared than them too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have there, I'm curious because you recently, or relatively recently, you played um, Alien Isolation. I don't know if you finished it. No, I, I, zero out of 10. I did not like that game. We can go into it and I will describe why. But. I, I would love to because I also, so I've got Stockholm Syndrome with that game. So oh, I started that game. everyone I know. Yes, yep. yes. It, it forces you, it forces you into liking it. And I, now, I mean, I changed all my art, but I used to have xenomorphs all over my wall. But like, I it genuinely could not finish that game for a while because I was so like tensed up. And then when I finally did finish it, I was like, Jesus Christ, what a slog that was. Like it was such, but it you, was but such you a still march. loved it, right? Oh like, yeah, I ended up loving it. And I, I don't, I could not tell you why. Like from a design standpoint, I couldn't tell you why. I will say every single, so the reason I played that game was because I put up a poll that was four horror games and that one won by like a long shot. And in fact, Martian Gothic was the second game on the list. And I ended up playing more of that than I did of Alien Isolation. And Martian Gothic is this horrible PS1 game, which I will go back to eventually, but <laughs> I needed a break from it. It's really you hard. You sound like me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, but with, with Alien Isolation, so I like a game. like I pl- So I played Prey, which Prey mm-hmm. 2017, one of my probably my top five games of all time. Uh, wow. I love Prey. Everything about that game is like a 10 out of 10. The visuals, the everything. And so... When I played Alien Isolation, I was like, oh, this is going to feel like Prey. We've got AI. We've got things chasing you. You're like going through a space station. But I had so many mishaps in Alien Isolation that I found were not my fault. So first off, I'm a, I'm a scaredy cat. And I was told later that the way that I was playing the game, I early unlocked 
all of the aliens AI tree. So the game, even though I was playing it on easy, was like at a, an 11 out of 10 difficulty. Yes. Right? Yes. And so I was told the only way to continue on was to start over again. And I was like, I can't, do, I just emotionally couldn't at that point. Yeah. But I had, I had situations where like there was a one point I walked into this big open room. It's like in the part where you're in medical yep. and I was just walking in and I was hiding in the corner and at some wet reason, a human being, which I know now that they're on AI also, mm -hmm. and the alien both entered the room in front of me. And the alien killed the human, and I didn't move. And then she turned and looked at me and killed me. Yeah. And I snapped. Like, as a human being, I was like, why did, why did I? Because I thought it was a cutscene. I was like, why did I get killed in this cutscene? Why did I get, you know, put into this corner in this cutscene? But it was because, like, I later, this is this is what really, like, emotionally, I was like, I can't play this anymore. I looked through a bunch of walkthroughs, and I was yeah. like, why did I go to this medical room, and I got, this cutscene happened, and then I died. Like, what was I supposed to do there? Well, the answer was, that uh, you unlocked all the wrong AI, and you just happened to go in there at the wrong time, and the alien happened to go in there. And I was like, okay, I like a good chase game. I've played all the Clock Tower games, and I... I minus clock tower too. I love, you know, clock tower, the original game I've played like AO Oni, uh, but it, it mimics this other game that I really don't like, which is called haunting ground. I don't know if you've heard of that one. Haunting ground has a very, very similar situation where the enemy is unkillable and really doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. And so like in things like clock tower, AO Oni, there's a lot of different, you know, in the same vein games, the enemy kind of goes away for a while sometimes and you can kind of like have a downtime or like relax for a little bit or something. And I don't feel like this game ever did that for me. Now I will say I would, I want to watch someone play alien isolation now the same way you're like, you know, sure. whatever. Cause there's gotta be, I know it's just not the right type of game for me as a player. Yeah. I'm a hide in the locker and I am me too. hiding in the locker is going to cause me problems. I'm not going to play the game. Yeah. Um, no, you know it took I mean? me like a legitimate year to like yeah. come back to the game because, and I did, I think I started over and I just, yeah. they were like, you just have to be more brave. And I was like, I and cannot. And that's the thing. Like <laughs> I'm not like, I, I'm scared. I'm a baby. I'm scared. I want to yeah. hide. And like, I think that the the game kind of punishes you for using the tools that it's given you. That can be a problem. You know what I mean? At least yeah. for me. But I, when I went and researched the, how the AI works in that game, I was like, this is literally the most impressive thing I've ever seen. I've never seen anything like this before. Those devs crushed it. I just can't play it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I so. And I think it does target, you're right. It targets like almost a certain kind of gamer that is... I don't want to say more aggressive, but like yeah. there is a certain subset of games that I think would fit that play style better and make you have a better time. But for people who are like us, who play yeah, like we're afraid of everything, right? Yeah. I hide everywhere. It just like the AI was like too smart for, for and, us to be able and to I do think, it. I think Prey did a really good job because Prey. So the one thing that Alien Isolation doesn't do that I wish that it would is like give you like, I don't want to call them power ups, but like in Prey, you get like the ability to like use things to make it so the guy, you're like you're, you have more stealth or, you know, if, if I could find a way to have more stealth, because I don't know where her range of vision is. You don't know any of that as a first time player. So that's, that makes me even more scared. And yeah. then I, of course, hide in the corner, you know? <laughs> yeah. Which is just yeah. like the natural way of things. Oh, yeah. So I'm curious, you 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 know a lot about game design and you said you are designing your own. Yeah. I I want to talk about that a little. What yeah, is it? Sure. How did you get started on that? So about two years ago. So okay, so I went to Columbia University, uh, Chicago. So like the Chicago art school. Nice. Um, I got my degree in writing poetry, but while I was taking the poetry classes, I also they had a de game design class there. So I took it and then I also took an ARG design. So it was an alternate reality games like Whoa. whole class. It was super cool. So both of those classes were really fun. And I also took this script writing course while I was there. And during that script writing course, I wrote this script, short script. And then like during COVID, I kind of came back to it again. And I said, wouldn't this idea be fun if it had a bunch of different paths you could go down? And at that point, I really understood more that making games wasn't just for like a studio. It wasn't just for like a team of, peop of people. I could take my idea 
and I could make it something. So I wrote out all these outlines for like the first 12 months, right? So I have a lot of outlines and ideas. And then I started playing around with Twine, which I don't know if you've messed around with Twine at all before, but Twine is like a, it's almost like an HTML kind of like thing. And you can really push its limits, but it was like all text based with some images because I'm not a visual artist Mm -hmm. at all. Um, But I realized that that wasn't going to quite take me where I needed to go to do something visually. So like, I think 11 months ago, I downloaded RenPy. I think that's how you pronounce it. I always just pronounce it RenPy, but it's the like visual novel software. I mean, Doki Doki Literature Club was made in it. A lot of VNs are made in it. Yeah. Um, And it's based off of Python, which at my previous job I was working in, I I used Python, SQL, and Ruby also to, to do stuff. So those languages are really like, word-based so like in renpy you can like write stop music and you don't have to like code a bunch of stuff in so right. I was like okay it's, it's, cool this it's is like, still in english <laughs> right yeah we're gonna start with um with that kind of language and so i a couple weeks ago i just started smashing things into renpy and like i have no idea what i'm doing right now literally zero idea and over the last you know 18 months i've like commissioned character art and i've commissioned some background art and i've like just like popped that all in and like took the text that I wrote and like these demos I wrote. And I'm like, just made a V V 0.1, right? Just to like make a thing. And it's not even like the game is huge. Like the concept is huge. It's a long VN, but I've made the intro. So it's like all the way up to you make your first choice. Essentially the plot of the game is it's a horror game, um, but it's, I, I won't reveal everything, but it's about um, a woman whose fiance passes away and she meets this woman who says, well, what if I can bring him back to life for you? Ooh. And so as a player, you get to make that decision. Do you want to bring your dead, dead fiance back or not? Um, the one catch, because you know there's always a catch, is that he, it's really hard. And there, uh, I was like, how do I got to write some lore? But it's really hard for this woman to, with whatever way she's doing this, to bring back his memories. So... He's going to have a lot of stuff. He's going to have his childhood, but he's not going to remember her at all. So, Oof. so does she bring him back knowing that she would have to like meet cute, start this relationship over with him? Or does she not and try to heal from all of the stuff that's been going on with her? And it's brutal. Yeah. And both of those through lines exist in the game. So it's not like you choose not to bring him back. Well, the game's over, right? It, it, I truly was like, I want the player to have, because I played the Walking Dead game and every choice you make in that game, well, not every, but most of them really don't mean anything by the end of the game, right? And I wanted some, I wanted your choices to really matter. Yeah. And so that was, and it's been really rewarding working on this for the last couple of weeks. I now understand like, I could, I feel like I could do a game jam just from the amount of like stuff I've worked on with this. Um, But the hardest part I'm finding is, like, it's really hard to do all of this by yourself. So I'm, like, at the point where I'm, like, like, I, I started, like, trying to make the gooey nice and, like, do all this stuff. And it, it is so difficult to be, like, a one-person team that I can't imagine. I see games come out where it was, like, one human being. Yeah. And I'm, like, holy moly, how did you have all of these skills? Um, yeah. And so I'm, like, now I'm, like, okay, I'm going to – there's going to be a point where I'm going to – have to start collaborating more too. So I'm like looking forward to that a lot also. Yeah, that's, it's very rewarding so far. Is your, is your end goal to actually release it as a full title that like you want people to play or do you just want to make this and be like, I made a thing and if it never releases, that's okay. So for a long time, I was like, I'm just writing this stuff down, you know, because like, I, I mean, I, as, as a person who writes poetry, Um, there are two kinds of people that write poetry. There's poets and then there's people who write poetry and uh, people who write poetry. They just want to write stuff and vomit it out and like let it free into the world, which is the most pure form. But then there's this level of like poet where you want that feedback. And I think there's something about this story to me that I want that feedback so badly, like that sometimes I'm just working on it and I'm like, bouncing ideas off of a friend and I'm like this isn't shit right this is okay right yeah 
And it's not like I'm like, oh, I'm going to, I'm not even trying to like make Undertale or something. Like I feel like so many people want to make their game be like the next like mind breaking thing. But I want to tell this story. And I found that telling it as a short film didn't work. And then telling it as this like outline didn't work. And so now that I'm like branching into telling it as this like interwoven narrative that reaches beyond what like one story can tell I realize, well, if as long if this doesn't get finished, I'm at least like going in progress toward it. And I yeah. think finishing, I finished Cooking Companions. I was mentioning this before. I mm-hmm. think which is Dear Dream Studios, and I think that's a solo dev. Also, maybe they like commission art, but they're also like a solo coder, solo coder and story writer. They they had like a thing in the, at the end of the game that said like I worked on this for five years, and that's the thing about these seeing all these indie games. Uh, the amount of respect I have for like you worked on this for five years that now I'm just like, you know what, if I work on it and I don't work on it for another two years and then I come back to it again, it's still, I'm still working on it. It's still, this is just a, making a game is really a big process, right? So like if this does turn into something where I can like share a story with a lot of different people and like make people maybe a little scared and have a little, you know, fun or think or whatever, then that's really like the end goal. And that's what all of my content I feel like feels like to me. Like I play almost all first person, sorry, first playthrough games. Mm -hmm. So I don't like play the same game over and over again. Like right now when my main playthrough I'm doing is Majora's Mask. I've never played through Majora's Mask and I've never seen anybody play through Majora's Mask. So this is like, right. But this is like an experience where I'm doing something for the first time in front of people. Mm -hmm. I don't know this game today. I spent like 20 minutes getting mad trying to do something that, you can't even do in the game. And people just sat there and watched me, right? And yeah. they just didn't, nobody said anything mean or anything. But like yeah. me making this experience to be like, oh, I'm sharing this with somebody. Like, yeah, you know, and and so like for making a game, it's like a very different experience because I want to be like, everybody check this out, check this out. But it's like, I don't know. It's still, it's still a baby. It's still a little baby, so. And you do have yeah. a little bit of the advantage at just – pressure wise that like you're not making this for a deadline exactly. for someone you know yeah this i don't is have your like thing yes i'm not like trying to like you know it's not like um i gotta get funds i gotta get out the door i gotta you know what i mean right. i'm just like tinkering here and there maybe i wake up in the morning and i'm like oh actually like i found this thing this is cool so yeah you know yeah, yeah. for sure do you so i'm i'm trying to like parse together like your jobs and everything you do what what do you do for full-time part-time like as your career I know like you work with GDQ obviously like you stream what's your I have a like a day job where I do support work that's like technical so I've been in like a technical field for you know 15 years almost I'm I'm gonna be 40 next year so I've been working like in the workforce for a long time which is really interesting because I'm talking about how like I'm a poet and I write poetry and I write stuff right and I like imagery and stuff but my day job is very technical and that's why game dev is like this other world too, where it's like, I'm using my skills that I got from like storytelling and like the experience from like writing stuff and and playing games. But then I'm also using this technical knowledge, which is like, you could want to tell whatever story you want when you're making a game, but if you can't make the game do the thing that you want the story to do, you can't do it. Right. Like when you're writing text, I could write anything I want, which like, I think about George R. R. Martin a lot. Like he wrote Game of Thrones because I don't, I think either he wrote it because he, no, I think he wrote it because he couldn't, if he, if it was a TV show, it would have cost too much money. So he wrote it because that was the way he could create that vision. So he wrote a book, which it's so funny that it turned into a TV show eventually. But, but like the, when you're making a game, you have big limitations that you don't have in, text or and depending on like the engine you use so it's super cool to like work within these limitations these technical things while I'm also like trying to tell this story of this girl who's like having a rough go of it right so yeah you've really kind of found the sweet spot like the best of both worlds where you're you have the knowledge and you have the ability so like just make the thing you know oh yeah and it's been super fun for sure (laughs) that's awesome do you So I'm curious, so you stream and you do some, I have a list of things you do because I I was like, I was like going on your website. I was like, holy cow, they do so much. Um, so you not only are a content creator and now a game dev, 
Uh, you also have a stream team. You have Clock you Tower. Do. The Clock Tower. It's yes. a stream team full of horror streamers predominantly. So cool. So it's um, so fun. Yeah, I mean, you can talk about it if you want. I don't know, like, oh, I, when it started or... we It was, like, a little over a year. We did our one year... We did, like, a um, marathon of, like, chaining together, like, raiding each other in... I think it was April, maybe? Maybe it was March. That was our one year. Um, and so, like, I really just couldn't find a horror stream team that was just, like, horror stream team. Like, yeah. I found some stuff that wasn't... Didn't really... I don't know. I was, like, it's not... It's really hard as like a horror content creator to find a stream team. I don't know why, but it just was really hard for me. And I was like, I had a vision one day where I was like, oh, I want to make the stream to call the clock tower. I was like, that was all I thought of was the clock tower. Because you know, every horror thing has a clock tower in it. Yes, it There's does. a clock tower series. There's Resident Evil as a clock tower. Every time I play another game where there's another clock tower, I'm like, they're following me everywhere. Um, <laughs> But then it was, it's been a really fun collaboration. We've raised money for charity. We've done marathon streams. We're going to do our first uh, speed running marathon coming up in October. Um, so it's really, really fun. Everyone on the team is really exciting. Some of us I got to meet at SGQ, which was really fun too. Um, and then, yeah, I, I really like, I think that it's very hard to find people who are, I don't, it's, uh, so many horror groups are like predominantly like a DVD kind of thing or like they're playing like, online horror stuff but this i feel like a lot of us are more um playing like solo stuff we have a lot of indie people that almost exclusively only play indie horror like noir mouse is on my team yep. and he almost only does that he works with like indie people too so like intentionally seeking out people who are into that same like genre of like the weird indie right so yeah yeah, yeah. that's super cool yeah and on on that note you mentioned a speed run uh marathon which you should send me like any information on oh that, yeah for I would sure totally be happy to support that um i'm curious how did you get into gdq how oh yeah so i don't know if you know who rom scout is i don't um so rom scout was one of the like a, when i first started doing let's plays in like 2008 he was one of the first people i ever met i actually met him in person a bunch we both lived in chicago at the time he was like literally the, the nicest person I ever met. So I was like super happy to hang out with him, um, talk to him a lot. And in like 2011, he was mentioning, oh, I'm going to AGDQ. And it, this is the second, it was like literally the second time they were doing AGDQ. And I was, I mean, I've been obsessed with speed runs since I first saw like a Super Mario Brothers 3 task. Of, and I was like, how is someone doing this? And then I yeah. found out, nobody's doing this it's a computer mm -hmm. and then I found out people sometimes do this too and I was like this is the coolest thing ever and so he was like you should come to this so I, I went to it and it was like one of the we wildest weeks of my life um this was when GDQ it was like literally there were a hundred of us if even that many people yeah. and I just had such a fun time I like met everybody the crowd was so like tight knit and we raised a bunch of money for charity. It was like over a hundred thousand. I was like, Whoa, this is so cool. Wild so kept, number compared oh to my now, gosh. right? <laughs> oh yeah. And I just kept coming back and staying involved and like making friends and stuff. And so like it, it just became like, I was in the right place at the right time to like meet the right people and know the right people and then want to help in the, in a way that not everybody wants to help. Like a lot of people, want to go to GDQ. They want to be on stage. They want to, you know, promote their stuff. Um, but a lot of these backstage roles that exist are so, so vital. Like I can't tell you the amount of hours people who are host judges have to listen to people talk for 10 minutes over and over again. Like I cannot tell you the amount of times like the tech crew, something breaks and they're scrambling and you'll never notice. And it's so, like for me, my role being safety and being, you know, helping people is so valuable and so important to me that like to make sure everybody's safe, making sure everyone's having a good time. And especially for as someone who's non-binary, making sure that queer people feel safe in the space because it is so important for everyone at GDQ yeah. um, that that women and, and non-binary people and, and any person who is, you know, um, gender non-conforming doesn't feel out of place or uncomfortable in these spaces. So having to being that voice in that crowd is, has been super vital. Not that like everybody isn't great, but just being one more little voice going, no, I don't think that's okay. Or yes, we should do this is like, and being able to help shape that has been uh, just amazing. And I also just, am not scared of people at this point in my life. 
So like being a person who is comfortable going up to someone and being like, hey, that's not cool. That's not cool. This is what we need to do. A lot of people are don't want to do that because that can be really scary. So, yeah. 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 I feel like you've probably done a, a wonderful job because I I am relatively new to GDQ. So like I started watching in 2018, started volunteering in 2020. Nice. Um, so like I'm I'm very new, but I always have seen it as a, an incredibly welcoming community, and I'm sure you've had a huge hand in that. So like, well, yeah, thank you. It it's been it's and it's not just been me. It's been like the whole safety team plus the management team at GDQ. Like, yeah, has always been like so supportive. Like, if I'm like, no, we shouldn't do this, or yes, we should do that, they always really listen to everybody on staff. Yeah. So it's so it's super important for sure. Yeah, this this last event, I think that was my first time, you know, on staff and getting to kind of see the behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. And y'all work so hard, <laughs> like, yeah. like unbelievably around the clock. Don't know how you survive the full week doing everything you do because it's it really a, is a huge production. Yeah, and my shift is at four in the morning, and I chose <sighs> that. I always do the. I do. I like that shift because yeah, somewhere between like two in the morning and six in the morning during a GDQ, it's kind of like weird hours, but that's when sometimes like there is the most that can be done to help people feel safe or whatever. And sometimes there's just like crises that happen in those hours. So it's nice to be around for that and be able to help too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've, you've done an awesome job. I'm really, I'm really glad that you've had a hand in that and that GDQ is still going in the direction it's going. Cause I feel like, especially with this last event, I know it was not an easy, an easy thing to have to deal with the whole situation in Florida. Oh yeah, definitely. There was a lot we had to do. And I I think like we have made the right choice, not going to Florida for this and having another online event. Um, and we'll see how things go in the future. I'm, I'm super optimistic myself. So yeah. I think it'll be great. Well, I I wanna I I wanna finish this off with some horror stuff, some horror Heck related yeah. stuff. So I want to get your opinion because you you've played a lot of horror games, played a lot of indie games. Do you have? I'm gonna say top three top three horror games that you've played in the last year. Okay, does this, like everything, everything? Sure, this can be retro. This can be indie. This can be anything. Okay, so obviously, like I said, Prey. Yeah. I cannot believe how much I loved that game. It truly, like, and I've, I've recommended it to, like, so many people now, and I've watched a couple of people play it recently, and it's so fun to watch other people play it, too. It's just such a good game. Um, I played Who's Lila recently, and I really like that, too. So Who's is that Lila an is an indie game, uh-huh, where it's, and it's on Steam. I think it might be on Itch, too. It's on Steam. And the game is essentially you um, have, you talk to people and you have facial movements. So when oh. you are talking to someone, your face will sometimes like, you see your face on the side of the screen and your face will like distort and change and stuff. So you can like, the endings of the game are based on, you have to answer a bunch of questions to the police for these certain endings. And oh. it depends on like how you answer them. So like if you, if the cops think you did something and you say like, well, why do you think it was me with a smile on your face versus with a frown versus with dis- a disgusted look on your face? So different. It, and it's 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 just a, such a unique game that I I would definitely suggest it to people. There, I would say there's some visual stuff that's like might be a little hard in the eyes depending. It's like black and white or like a two tone game, so like World of Horror or something like that. Yes, where it's it's very flat. It looks like an old game, but it's so interesting. And you like beat the game over and over again. So you like beat the game once and you think it's the end, but it's not the end because you can then unlock other things and other weird stuff happens. And there's like a second app that's like a demon that opens on your, I can't even, you just have to check it out. And it's not that expensive. It's on Steam. And I think it's probably another like solo or like single dev. Really, really enjoyed that game. I Such love an, that. So interesting. And I didn't, when I stream stuff like that, I don't 100% it. So I didn't even see everything. And I'm sure there's just, even more that's like super good that I would thoroughly suggest too. Okay. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to say one game that's, it's a horror game. I have to say it just because how much like it, like the series has affected me, but Danganronpa um, really yeah. like, so I played the, th- all three of those games in the last um, two years or so, or maybe even not that long, but I played Danganronpa two in like January of this year, that game. And I, the game, 
both two and three, I think they're horror, but not psycho. Well, they're psychological too, but it's, it's in such like, I always say to people, you know, a lot of people are like, well, what is a horror game? What isn't a horror game? I always, my, my, my motto is every game's a horror game when Beep Salt's playing it. That's like what we say <laughs> in my stream because I get jump scared by everything. But Danganronpa is, is such like a thematically scary game. Yes. So terrifying. And the way that V3 ends is absolutely like the devs saying, screw you to the players. The story saying, screw you to the players. And I ate it up. I loved it because I love like such like a massively downer situation. Yeah. Where like there's just something about those games where they're also like VNs, but they're like messed up and there's like there's like weird choices and you can't see everything, but they're and they're so like also so Japanese that there's just like something about them that hits on like another level. So I loved playing those. The first one is okay. And then I also get, you get attached to some of these characters. Yes. Like there's sure. a character in the second game who um, ends up killing somebody. But the way that this character like describes why they did, and anyone who knows me will know who I'm talking about because I have like plushes and like stuff of that character. <laughs> I, I'm obsessed with them already. Um, but like, it's so cool to see like a messed up weird viewpoint and be like, actually, I agree with that. Yeah. That's so like, and, and you're like, man, you just killed somebody, but I, I, uh, I'm with you still. So yeah. like those three, those are three games that I've played in the last like year that have been like, oh my God, they're so good. So I love them that to everyone. Yeah. I, uh, I wouldn't have like, I, I do recognize Danganronpa as like its own horror kind of thing. Yeah. 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 But I love that that was your, that was one of your top three games. Cause it's not, I don't think it's, it's the first one to come to mind. Like when I look at the list of games I played on stream, there's like for every layers of fear, there's like 10 games where I'm like, is Fallout New Vegas a horror game? Yeah. Maybe it is. You know what I mean? Like I'm like, oh, it's, I see some stuff going on in there. So we know. should definitely like in the future, we should do uh, just an episode of this where we like have a list of games, like oh, 10 and, like, and, and we go, is this a horror Absolutely. game? And then oh, we yeah. go through and we try to like analyze it. Cause because I think that is, sounds so is fun. Is Resident Evil 4 a horror game? I don't right. know. If, right. Maybe. I don't know. We're going to, we'll have to talk. <laughs> I love that. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I got to ch chat with you. Yeah, Do sure. you want to just like shout out your socials? Where can people find you? I'm literally beep salt everywhere. <laughs> like I'm beep salt everywhere. Um, people ask where my name came from. Random no name generator. If you know my old name, no, you don't. Um, I've had the screen name for like four years now and I will never change it. And it's beep salt. So like, um, a noise and then uh, chloride, um, and it's I'm that everywhere. Um, and if you, it, it, yeah, I, that's I'm I'm on it. Except for I think I'm all, also on TikTok. I don't really post on TikTok, but I think that's dot TTV or something like that. And then the Clock Tower stream team is also on uh, like team slash the Clock Tower on you on Twitch. Um, and I my my main channel for like uploading playthroughs. So if you're curious about my reactions to any games or, or any playthroughs of any games I've played in the last couple of years is on uh, a channel on YouTube called Beep Salt Extra Sodium. Oh, I um, love and that. And that is, that is my full, like the full playthroughs of stuff that I post up there. So awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Well, thank you for doing yeah, this again. Yeah, it's been super fun chatting with you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, and of course. And for everyone else, I will see you in the next one. Goodbye. Bye.